So trade with China has been at the top of the news for a while, and of course tariffs. I um, wanted to make a video about tariffs originally, but the more I um, uh, looked into it and the more I tried to structure the video, it really ne I needed to break it up into three parts. So what's um, this will be the first of a three-parter. Part one, really walking through what tariffs are, how they work, what how do they fit within free trade and um, in what we're calling a trade war. Then, then two other parts, one really going into detail about China, or into at least more detail about China, and uh, part three going into more detail about the U.S., because it's important to understand what the history has been and where we are today to kind of understand these moves. Um, so here goes part one. First of all, uh, we, we keep hearing the terms trade war, tariffs, free trade, fair trade, etc., etc., what you know? How does how do tra tariffs fit in um, into free trade? Um, Trump keeps saying that China is eating the cost, and of course the media is criticizing him right back, saying no, 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 American people are eating the cost, and and that he's an idiot. Um, so how do they really work? Okay, um, so the first part. This video is going to basically walk you through how tariffs work, how importation works, and uh, how the money will flow not just in the immediate transaction of the tariff, but overall. So you can understand when when a statement is uh, made like China's eating the cost, what does he mean? You know, it isn't that China is actually writing a check. Okay, so I'm going to use the example of a clothing store. In my uh, misspent youth, I, uh, I had to manage a clothing store and um, uh, it was menswear. So we ordered things uh, internationally. So I had to deal with uh, customs and importation, all that stuff. So I'll walk through the basics of the business and how you deal with uh, clearing the cost and all that stuff in uh, international trade. And then I'll walk into the more the, uh, the macroeconomics and geopolitical aspects of it. So you buy shirts locally. You're, you're a clothing store guy. You've got a store. You're trying to make some money. Locally, the shirts are really good quality. The guys charge you 20 bucks per shirt. And the market price is about 28 bucks. So you get a, an okay markup of $8. Not great, but uh, this is the average for, for this kind of business. Um, and of course, it's local jobs and it's local quality. You're, you're helping the local market. But you also have local competitors. So how do you differentiate yourself? Obviously, you want to sell your shirts more um, and they need to stand out from your competitors. So you can be more creative in terms of, let's say, the designs of the shirts, uh, you know, the, the colors, the choices, etc. Um, maybe you can design a different type of fashion, a different cut of a shirt, etc. You could create a brand, try to drive loyalty towards that brand, maybe associate with some sort of subculture, whatever. Again, creativity type stuff. Um, or you could be just very high touch service, very, um, very helpful, very unique service, and that you'd get differentiated by the type of service you provide. The one area that you really don't have much flexibility in is price competition. Um, realistically, for you to run a sale, so if everybody else in your in your market is selling that same shirt for twenty eight dollars, and you want to say make it you know sell it for twenty five, well either you're going to take a drop on your markup, or maybe you can talk to your to the maker to the manufacturer and have him um, drop some of the some of his price, so maybe you can share in some of that loss. But again, very very tight uh, choices. So that's your business if you don't look to alternate sourcing. But of course you get a bright idea. I'm going to buy from China. Why China? Because you can buy the same exact shirt in China, let's say, the same quality, the same cut, same everything, for $10. Now, that's a compelling deal, right? Because if you just uh, take it and sell it for the same price and not differentiate at all, you so, now you're making $18 a markup. So all of a sudden, your margins are huge. So you're raking in a lot of dollars. But as you begin to do that, of course, invariably, you realize, well, wait a minute. I don't just want to get more per shirt. I want to sell more shirts. So I'm going to put on a sale. I'm going to sell it for 25 bucks because now I've got this markup of 18 bucks. I can easily afford to shave some dollars off because it ain't markup of $8. So what happens? You attract quite a bit of more business because your prices are more competitive, but the local market has one single negative effect, which is whatever the, the contribution you were making to the local shirt makers, um, those orders are no longer coming in. So maybe you'll order once in a while, but overall, you, the bulk of your orders are going to China. So now you've negatively impacted your local market, but you've positively impacted your bottom line. Now, of course, you've got competition. 
and they're not going to sit still, right? Um, so they're going to react. They see your sales. As, boy, this guy is selling the same goddamn thing for 25 bucks. What can we do? Now, if they're completely idiotic and they're not prepared and they're just, you know, paralyzed in their heads, then they'll fold up. That's wishful thinking. It's, you know, they may fold up eventually, but they won't fold up right away. Um, what their first tool is what your first tool was. Go to the local manufacturer and try to get their prices down. Try to take a little haircut on your markup so you can meet the sales price. But now, where are they? They're matching your price, but they're operating on a really depressed markup, and they're really, you know, stressing the relationship with the with the local um, manufacturer. That may that may be fine, but uh, sooner or later, somebody's going to look at one of your shirts and say, "Oh, it says made in China." Well, why don't I go buy from China? So now they buy from China, and now they can do exactly what you're doing: sell it for twenty five dollars and markup of fifteen, right? But you took some of their share as you were doing this, right? So you've been getting these, these shirts from China for a while. You've been attracting a lot of the customers. So they go, ah, you know what? I'm going to reclaim some of that lost share. I bought it for 10. I'm going to sell it for 20. And I'll live with a markup of 10. Because hell, I've been living with a markup of 7. Ooh, now that's a problem. Because now you've got a really drop. I mean, you've got prices dropping. So price depression is the first symptom. Um... And of course, both you and your competitors are buying from China. Local makers aren't making any business, so they fold up. So now you've lost the, the supporting uh, part of the, of the sector, right? The manufacturing. Now, what can you do? You come up with another idea. I'm going to get some lower quality shirts because they've got these other shirts. I can buy them for five bucks. They're not as good, but hell, for five bucks, I can mark them up to 18 bucks. And I mean, I can mark them up to 18, make a markup of $13. And shit, I can mix them in with my $20 shirts and I can still salvage some of that markup that now is being depressed all the way to 10 bucks. Well, your competitor obviously is going to want to compete. So he's going to say, you know what? Screw it. I'm going to buy them for five, sell them for 10, live on a $5 markup and try to drive this guy out so I can start reintroducing everything else. So this is sort of the, the, the ping pong game that happens that ends up driving, you know, competitors will drive prices down until they're sort of a happy equilibrium. Um, invariably, as you begin to, to introduce uh, the difference in, um, in manufacturing and quality, overall quality of the product that's available in the local market would decline. But because the quality is declining, people aren't buying it as often, right? So your sales are declining. Now, because you've also engaged in this price war, your markup is now very tight, and you're no longer getting the sales volume, this is where you can put yourself at risk because now you have very little markup on very few sales, and now you can't respond really to, to upcoming changes in the marketplace, and so you may very well end up folding up. So that's a risk. And the most important thing here is that through this exercise, at the end of the day, China now has all of the clothing maker jobs. So you really don't, you know, you can't really even restart the game because you no longer have the local population of jobs. Now, of course, I'm running through a scoop to nuts sort of evolution of, uh, of, of a price war and a, and a declination in price. But there's more players in this game. It's not just you and, uh, and your competitors. You've got the, the manufacturers, too. So what are they going to do? Well, they're going to go to the government and say, well, you know what? We need your help. So they're going to create a lobby, and they're going to lobby the government to do something about this threat that they're seeing of Chinese goods coming in and threatening their whatever manufacturing business, you know, clothing manufacturing. This happens a lot with farm, with, uh, you know, so the, there's a soy council, there's a uh, milk council, there's a sugar council, all kinds of, uh, of various uh, uh, materials that are being uh, created. So what can a government do? Well, first and foremost, they might choose to do nothing, right? They don't have to do anything. That's typically what the U.S. response is. They usually do absolutely nothing, and you get messages like, well, we need to be more competitive with the global market, and blah, 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 blah. Um, not very helpful, and usually what that means is that they're, they're basically abandoning this side of the business, this piece of, uh, of the market, um, in favor of, of the international comp uh, competition. It isn't very smart, but sometimes in a true market, in the true free trade marketplace, you don't want the government to interfere. To, to, inter to interfere. That's typically cheating. Um, now, there's another thing they can do. They can ban imports of shirts. They can say, you know what? No shirts will be allowed to come in from China or Japan or anywhere. Therefore, the only shirts that you can buy in America are American shirts. 
again, that's that's something that that China and Japan do quite a lot. Um, in fact, the British Empire a lot, was largely built on this. They were they would keep things away from certain markets, and it took them a long time to actually embrace the full free trade uh, idea. Um, and then, of course, there's there's other ways that they can respond. These are more subtle, and this is where um, where traffic uh, tariffs come in. They can create a tariff. They can say, you know what? We'll fix this. We'll put a ten dollar Chinese uh, shirt tariff. Any shirt that comes in, yeah, you bought it for ten, but now you got to pay the government ten before you can clear it out of customs. So now back is, it's back to twenty bucks. So you might as well buy from American markets. Uh, that's that's basically the same tool as you know, try, not without fully banning the importation of uh, of the good. You are trying to unfairly uh, unfairly add some uh, some weight to the competition of of a product. Um, that's this is where you start beginning to feel like this is really really cheating in terms of uh, in terms of trade. There's an even more subtle response that they could have, which is a subsidy. So rather than telling the buyer, the importer, to say, "Look, you have to pay ten dollars per shirt," the lobby group approaches the government and says, "Look, have the taxpayers." pay me $10 per shirt. And that way, every time I make a shirt, I can sell it to the guy for 10 bucks. And then you, the taxpayers give me back and give me another 10 so I can make my 20. But the guy's buying locally. So now I can compete. And there's no visible tariff on the border. So subsidies are very, very tricky because they're not necessarily as obvious as uh, tariffs. And, um, and it's usually uh, this is full government uh, uh, involvement and they can be used to to really unfairly drive somebody out of the um, out of the marketplace by subsidizing something heavily you're really giving some unfair prop up to to a piece of industry now some many many governments do our government does it for certain farmers for certain uh, key uh, industries and this is what's often called the the tragedy of the commons right the the interests of a focused few can affect the government and because the cost is spread widely across all taxpayers, there's no real counter group to, to lobby back to say, no, 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 you're not going to increase my taxes because the people that make sugar want to protect their jobs. So that's why subsidies in general are, are considered a bad idea. Now, of course, this implies that just the U.S. government has done something to combat something coming from China. But of course, at the same time, the Chinese government needs to respond too. And they'll have a number of things to do. We won't go into those just yet. Now, there's this view, the sort of practical view of the buyer and the seller and then what the government can do. There's also the economics view. Uh, for those of you that are fans of Milton, Freedom, uh, <laughs> Milton Friedman, um, there's this, uh, there's a concept that he talks about all the time in free markets, the invisible hand. This is from John Stuart Mills. Um, so let's talk about markets in general. The market where you bought the shirt and you imported it and you sold it in the re all of that is a commodities market, right? These are commodity products. They're being sold, bought and sold. This is the normal commerce, uh, the normal market, if you would. The way to look at the problem that uh, we just outlined, stated another way, is there's U.S. demand for cheaper Chinese goods, right? So U.S. buyers are looking for cheap Chinese goods. Awesome. So what does that mean? The U.S. buyer has dollars. The Chinese manufacturer, he needs yuan. He needs to pay his people in yuan. He needs to pay his costs, etc. So one of these two guys has to convert their, you know, convert money. So then comes in the currency exchange market. That's a separate market. Um, basically, people buy and trade, you know, buy and sell currencies. So if you've got pounds and you want dollars, I'll sell you the X, X number of dollars for F for X number of pounds. And the prices fluctuate based on supply and demand. Well, this little uh, demand right now its effect is going to drive the supply of dollars up, and it's going to also drive the demand for for for, uh, for yuan up. So all of a sudden, there's plenty of there. There's a little bit more dollars to be had, and there's a little bit less yuan to be had, or more demand for yuan to be had. Each one of these will have an effect on the price of the other. Dollar drops, yuan rises. But what does that mean? Well, the way to think about it is a weaker dollar means U.S. goods are cheaper, right? When something's weaker, when you're when you go to some place in the Caribbean and your dollar gets converted into you know ten of their local currency, all of a sudden you feel like you're super rich. Um, that means U.S. goods bought in U.S. dollars are now cheaper because the U.S. dollar is cheaper. 
Similarly, with the yuan getting stronger, China prices are a little bit higher. Well, the only the, the very reason you went to China to buy stuff was that stuff was cheaper. But now it's gotten more expensive. Now, not a lot, but a little bit. So the problem is that when this stuff gets more expensive, when the, when the currency exchange market gets affected, it affects all products. So all of a sudden, it isn't just Chinese shirts that are more, more expensive a little bit. Everything in China is more expensive. So people back off. They don't buy as much. So now you can see how these two markets have a uh, corresponding relationship. They tend to balance each other out, right? Now, except that there's a problem. So whenever you hear this advice, well, we should be completely open because the, ba the markets uh, balance themselves. Um, it's always a theoretic view. And it is true. It isn't, it isn't wrong at all. But there's basically one problem, which is really two problems. The problem is it takes time. So now you have to wait because every one of these pushes that drives the, the dollar up or the Chinese uh, yuan down, every one of these little impacts have a very, very imperceptible effect and they have to accumulate. And for large players, that means they can game the market because they can drive enough changes. They can push in enough demand or enough supply that they know that they will create an effect long before everybody else who doesn't know about that move will know it. So you'll see... You'll see a lot of activities. You know, George Soros is famous for having uh, trying to marshal an assault on the British pound. Uh, you often hear Trump accusing China of currency manipulation. Uh, Japan was engaged in currency manipulation in the 80s. That's when uh, Lighthizer, the uh, the trade representative that we have now with China, that's when he was engaged by, by Reagan to go smack them around. So it isn't something that you're really comfortable giving as a, count, as a, as a fix or as a cure. Because, yes, it'll cure things. But it takes a long goddamn time and, and it takes long enough that you could actually, you know, focused large players could drive their competitors out of business. Because, you know, how many years can you take if all of a sudden you're not getting orders? Yeah, you know that prices will balance, but if they're not balancing out tomorrow, you're not getting the orders you need tomorrow. So that's the economics view. Now, how do you go about importing stuff in the practical sense? So you've got the importer, the buyer, the guy who owns the store. And what does he care about? He basically cares about limiting his risk. You know, he wants to either limit it or share it with, uh, he's looking for a buy, for a seller who would be willing to share the risk. He cares about optimal turnover, meaning he needs to be able to sell whatever he bought, whatever he puts money out to buy as a product, he needs to sell it as soon as possible to have it spend as little time on the shelf as possible because he needs to reclaim that money because he needs to go buy another product that he can sell, right? Because how does he make his money? He makes his money eight bucks at a time in the markup, right? So every twenty dollars that he's got locked up in a shirt is is sitting there not making him any money. Um, so outflow is very important. Uh, obviously, cash inflow is also important. So he's going to want to minimize all the cash outflow that he can. So what does that mean in terms of uh, what's he got to do? He's got to look for financing. Um, now, <clears throat> when you're a more advanced company, when you've got you know, you've been successful for a while, you got some capital built in the bank. Yeah, maybe you can purchase your goods outright and you can afford to, to have some of your money be tied up. But a lot of the smaller businesses maybe cannot, right? Uh, so you try to get as creative as possible and finance whatever you're trying to buy. It may cost you some uh, a little bit in interest, but at least it gives you the flow, the, ca the, the capability to continue to trade. So he's going to look for an exporter. Now, what does the exporter look for? He's looking to sell. He's looking to close that sale. So if anybody's ever been in a sales environment, you know, you try to overcome, you try to have an answer for whatever the question is from your buyer. So, well, the number one question from your buyer, aside from, you know, do you have the right product? Do I like it? Whatever is financing. So, of course, sellers, especially exports, um, they engage in something called factoring, which is basically financing. They either do it directly if they're large enough um, because it is a risk. Uh, or they try to work together with a factoring company that, that does that type of financing. Now, the financing can be very, very creative. Um, there's places, there's there's areas that, uh, there, there's people that will allow you to pay as you sell, right? So they'll send you 100 items of this, and as you sell, every 10 you sell, you send them a check, right? So they're taking a huge risk. They could, you know, if, if your inventory burns up, then they, they might be out of full pocket, right? Um, that's one method of factoring. Um, there's a return or credit unsold portions, right? So they'll uh, they'll tell you, you know, it's a seasonal seasonal good. They said they'll send you three thousand of them for Halloween, and whatever you don't sell by 
you know, Halloween plus 10 days, send it back and, uh, and you don't have to pay for it, right? Those kind of things. So these are all type of uh, products where you can take some sort of speculative risk. Um, the other more practical aspects are shipping costs. Well, you need to get the stuff from here to chi from China to here. Maybe, maybe they might want to front the shipping costs. That's fairly rare. And also um, clearing costs. And I'll explain what those are in just a minute. But they might choose to, you know, cover those up front to minimize your, uh, to minimize any sort of hurdle you might have for getting them here. Um, again, like I said, those latter two are very rare. And of course, they need to collect payment in some way, shape, or form at some point. So that's the buyer and the seller. So I think of it as the U.S. the U.S. Uh, guy with a with a clothing store and the Chinese guy with a manufacturing plant. But there are other players. There's Customs. Now Customs is an institution. It's answerable to the government and it's also a business. So it has its own concerns, and none of them are you. Um, basically, what is their job? Well, when you've ordered your shirts, the exporter, you know, dutifully wrote down your shirts, agreed with you on the terms packed a full, a full container of them and shipped them out. So now the container arrives, they receive it, they store it, they look through it, and they basically tell you, they send you an invoice, a clearing invoice. Here's how much is due, and here's how long you have before you need to pay us for this and pick it up. Uh, they also do other things like, you know, check for contraband, illegal drugs, whatever. That's part of their customs duty. All of that stuff to you means that it will it may hold up the, the delivery if there's some issue, or... Uh, you may get charged a small fee for, for the service of that being provided. Now, um, what dues are you usually uh, expecting on that clearing invoice? Well, the shipping costs, if they haven't been covered by the, uh, by your, by the shipper. Um, any warehousing costs. So however long you let it sit at customs, obviously they're storing it. It's going to be a minimal fee. Um, and of course, any taxes or tariffs. So let's say that you ordered a million dollars worth of shirts. And there's a um, and there's no tariff, right? Then whatever the shipping cost was, let's say three thousand dollars, and uh, maybe you know fifteen bucks per day of uh, warehousing. So you you know you you pay two grand, and boom, you take your million dollars worth of merchandise. But if there is a tariff, let's say five percent, then you better have fifty thousand dollars to pay that tariff plus the shipping cost and the warehouse uh, warehousing cost to lift your your container full of stuff. And, and it's as harsh as that, because if you do not clear it by the time, there really isn't, they, they don't care. They'll just simply auction it off. Now, there's some, some uh, places have uh, the ability for you to pay a fine and they'll store it for a bit longer if you're just going through some uh, temporary straits. But by and large, clear your stuff or it's out. Um, which, enter, which now takes us to the fourth player in this marketplace, the jobber. Uh, the jobber is the guy, you've watched all the, I'm sure you've seen shows like uh, Storage Wars. Every place that has stuff that they auction off has people that buy it and try to resell it. And because it's an auction, you're going to get things at a super low price. Now, usually it's not the same as, uh, for example, a, a storage facility. Because the storage facility, they have no idea what the hell is in there. They can't really put any value estimations on them. Whereas in customs... You've got a shipping invoice. You know exactly what's in there, how many, what colors, what sizes, etc. All that stuff is in the shipping invoice. Um, but they also don't care about recovering any of that cost. Their cost is specifically to, to cover their warehousing cost and shipping. And uh, if applicable, tariffs, right? Because tariffs apply to anybody who is able to take that those goods out. Now, depending on how the tariff is uh, calculated, if it's, say, 10% of value... And the declared value is X, but all of a sudden the uh, customs is selling it to you for for a portion of that. Then all of a sudden the tariff drops too. So in many cases, jobbers can pick up these containers for just dirt cheap. Uh, to give you an example from my, like I said, from my misspent youth, um, we had a store of uh, of men's uh, um, men's clothing, so suits and ties and things of that nature. An Armani suit, like a proper George Armani suit, uh, that we would retail for about two thousand. Um, should cost around one thousand something if when we were ordering it, but a jobber often would bring bring them to us that, and he would sell them to us for between fifty and a hundred dollars. So it gives you an idea of sort of the the price depreciation that happens. Um, oftentimes, you know, ties that we would retail out for a hundred dollars, they were coming to us for two dollars from a jobber, right? Um, so instead of paying usually, you know, forty to fifty percent of the retail price. You're paying one to two percent of the retail price, so that's very attractive. That's why 
uh, whenever jobbers would come around in their van, you would be very interested to see what they had. And sometimes it was junk, sometimes it was excellent things. Um, these jobbers basically are very connected to the local distributor. So your competitors, they know where those competi your competitors, right? So they will be taking your stuff and bringing it to you. It, they, they may very well, you know, auction that thing and bring it to you and sell it to you at a fraction of the price uh, if you're still in business, right? So again, what's important to remember here is heavy discounts. Okay, so now let's layer tariffs on that. What's reality with tariffs? Well, it really boils down into two cases. The normal case is this. For most businesses, if you have any planning whatsoever, and you better if you're running any sort of business that relies on uh, on an, an, an import export, you've got a certain a certain stage of financial planning. So you know when you've put in the order what your cash position is going to be by the time uh, the shipping comes in. So you're going to know roughly what you need to clear it. So you've planned ahead, right? Um, you you're expecting the cost of that tariff. Otherwise, you you know you don't order it. Um, so for that, you actively monitor all of your sourcing, right? So you may have one by one manufacturer in China, you have some in India. You, you're doing that for all of your uh, for all of your sources, and you're looking at the, you know, you're, you're even looking at changes in shipping costs because shipping costs fluctuate. You're looking at changes in taxes. You're looking at changes in uh, tariffs, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So the reason you're doing that is that your job as a purchasing. Uh, manager is to seek stability to make sure that you're stable in terms of what you're spending not only are you buying the right things but but you don't have any sort of uh, bottom line surprises with the cost when a tariff is announced like the way trump did then you have a choice right you basically pick up the phone and you call your buyer you call your manufacturer say hey uh guess what i've been buying these things for you from you at x and i just heard trump you know he he cranked tariffs up so it's going to cost me this now overall to buy it from you which eats my markup so we need to we need to discuss it because either you can basically offer me a better price or i'm going to need to to figure out what i need to do maybe find it from another location that doesn't uh, doesn't have tariffs so a lot of times what will the manufacturer do well he's you know you're a good customer he doesn't want to lose you he might as well sell you stuff at say a 20 percent discount than not sell you anything so oftentimes you'll get the relief from the manufacturer. So yeah, you're paying the tariff when the stuff comes in, but it's being paid in the relationship. So you're not really losing because the number one thing is you're trying to maintain an overall cost package so you can, uh, uh, you can, you can be competitive in the new market. They often say, well, it gets passed on on consumer. Yes and no, because if you're the guy that basically got a tariff from China and you're competing with guys who, who's getting similar stuff from India and he doesn't have a tariff to cover, you would be an idiot to pass it on to the consumer because you're ju you're just now positioning your prices higher. So people are just going to turn around and go to your competitor. So it isn't as easy as they just get played back to the consumer. Some might, but not usually. Um, and of course, if um, if the if the manufacturer says no, can't do anything, then you just recompete re the contract and you find another supplier. Um, also, prolonged tariff instability no matter how accommodating the manufacturer is, the buyer will probably choose, you know, it, as soon as this whole thing with China happened, you can bet your bottom dollar that most of the people dependent on China started exploring alternatives. And now a lot of them have reduced the amount of the, the dependence that they have with China because obviously what they care about is stability. Unless China, unless you happen to be in the un, unenviable position of having only China as the only place in the whole world that can make whatever widget you've got, uh, then you're likely going to look for other sources because, you know, you don't want to have your business impacted because there's some sort of uh, interaction between China and the U.S. So let's talk about the negative case. Um, this is the case where the tariffs are surprised or the tariffs are unaffordable, whatever. Um, so what happens? you got limited cash on hand. You can't clear the container. The merchandise is gone. That's the worst case, right? Now, it's bad for you. No, no question about that. So you pick up the phone and you tell the manufacturer, hey, um, this thing surprised me. I didn't have enough on hand. It's gone. Now the the merch, the guy can go after you in court, right? But then again, if you didn't have enough money to clear it, you're prob he's probably not getting his money. If, however, this was just a matter of the tariff surprised you, you paid it, and now you're going back to the manufacturers to get some relief later on, then you're really back into normal case one. But this is the worst case, which is you've lost the merchandise. Um, 
the merchant may may try to go after you but again if you're really going out of business there's nothing to to do and if uh, if you're staying in business then he's got to weigh the con the idea of no more future business or does he basically extend some more help to you some more credit to you to keep you floating in a so that way he can at least make up his loss by your by by future uh, purchases that you might make from him so it isn't exactly as cut and dry as you know he's going to go sue you now what does happen though is for that merchandise the manufacturer has lost all value of the goods they're not making anything they may be on the off chance that they might sue you or or you stay in business and you try to you know try to pay him off at a minimum he he'll get some some amount of value back but on a on a long delay however what happened to the US market because the goods are here they've been sold to a jobber they've already entered the marketplace they're being sold by your competitors they acquired them for very cheap prices so the market pro the market actually benefits so this is another way that and, and that's not calculated oftentimes that uh, that the local market actually improves so let's look specifically at what uh, what happened with Trump stuff so with Trump um, the normal thing happened manufacturer responded with lower pricing but more importantly, China as a country responded by devaluing their currency because they saw this coming because there was, you know, obviously there was um, there was quite a bit of telegraphing because Trump said that all through his um, all through his pre-election um, and their devaluation games nullified about 8% of what was the original 10% tariff. Um, so in general, Chinese goods were actually much more attractive because the dollar was much stronger you know, it was 8% basically uh, differential between the, the strength of the dollar versus the yuan. So it, it compensated. So overall, the market didn't really feel it. I mean, it's questionable whether or not 10% would have been that much to feel anyways on, on the, the basket of goods that was being tariffed. But uh, that 10% really worked out to be more like 2 to 0. However, that wasn't necessarily not something that was felt on the other side. And uh, what he did in response, it isn't necessarily as repeatable as you might think. Um, the manufacturer costs went up, right? Because uh, all of a sudden, you know, Chinese, uh, to, Chinese to devalu they devalued their currency. So everything the manufacturer also needs to buy because he's, he may be making shirts, but he's buying cotton from someplace and he's paying uh, laborers, etc. His costs go up. Three million jobs were lost out of that correction, right? And a fair amount of U.S. dollars that, uh, that uh, China used to basically... Uh, to game the system to purchase and and you know kind of create some demand uh, they can't really afford to do that that much three million may not sound like a lot when you're talking about China's you know one billion population but it isn't insignificant so all of a sudden this kind of currency manipulation game and uh, and not and not to help matters uh, Trump immediately called them I called them currency manipulators blah 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 so now the eyes of the world are on them so it's much more difficult to effectively manipulate your currency now um and of course at a and it it didn't absorb the entire hit some buyers as soon as trump started saying there's going to be a trade war they started looking right and a lot of them were relocated because there's there's plenty of places to relocate and of course what's been happening since is we've been collecting a nice new you know stream of revenue in the commerce department uh and they've been attempting to calculate how what segments are being hit by by, by what pieces of uh, of the Chinese uh, agreement. Um, they calculated, I think, on one round of moves, there were some sixteen million dollars that they thought they were going to be affected to the farmers. So they basically put sixteen million aside and they pushed it back to farmers into subsidies. That's a that's actually a pretty good way to use subsidies because you've uh, you're able to to sort of compensate for a for a counteraction. Um, and uh, of course it gave the trade negotiations some uh, le legitimacy because and this is the important thing it's important not to look at the trump tariffs as two parties on a fair and balanced relationship and one party stands up and punches the other in the face it the reality of the of the situation is more like for 30 years one party's been getting punched in the face and then finally they got up and punched back for the first time in 30 years. So it's important to keep that in mind because the compare the 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 fair the, the the sheer imbalance of this of this relationship is so long it's it's so large and so lengthy um and so unfair 
that, and I'll go into the details as to why that is, but it is literally 5% of our GDP every fucking year for 30 years. Now, remember, people were dancing in the streets when our GDP was, was now uh, growing at 3%. Imagine if all of a sudden you could have another 5% every year from now on, period, without doing anything different, except not getting ripped off. Um, that's how important this is. So this is why he's fighting the, this hard. So in any case, this gave the trade team some legitimacy. Um, so when they have, these are the requirements that we have. We want to have a full share of open market. A great deal of the market is closed to us in China. We want to protect our intellectual property. We want whatever enforcement to be measurable um, and to be enforceable. We don't just want to say, hey, here's how we'll perform. And then China ignores it, which has been the case. And we want to make sure that we have visibility that, you know, yeah, we'll take tariffs down. You'll take tariffs down, but that, that doesn't mean you're going to subsidize things on the back end. So we want to have a fair, uh, a fair and transparent sort of exchange. However, in the second round. So you might recall that around the G7 meeting, China. Um, well, there was some obviously we you didn't see the news about China's side, but this is what happened four days about uh, four days before the the next scheduled meeting, uh, no, trade representatives meeting that they were supposed to have. The Chinese, and we were making supposedly fair progress up to that point. Uh, they were expressing like, well, really, it's 90% done. You know, they, they had kind of hammered out most of the large details. So you get this impression of, uh, of a 90% done contract. The reality of it, there's no such thing as a 90% done contract because what happens is you take all of the difficult things and you push them till the end, right? You try to go through all the easy stuff. So the 90% that you get through is really meaningless. It's the last 1% that really is the contract. Because without it, you don't have a contract, and almost all of your uh, all of your make it or break it clauses are in that ten percent. Now, uh, so four days before their their next scheduled meeting, they remove the fifty pages of enforcement out of a hundred seventy page contract. So literally all the enforcement, so all the penalties and measurements and you know whatever. Um, that kind of move is if it happens between two western westerners, it's it's called the, like I mean it's a dick move. You, at this point, you might. You might want to just get up and flip the table over and tell them fuck off and never see them again. It's not the kind of move you would do in traditional Western business. It is very much in keeping with uh, with the Chinese. They they have gotten away with pure murder in um, in uh, negotiations in the past, um, and we'll walk through why that is. But uh, yeah, so that happened, which didn't sit well. Not only did they do that, they tried to apply pressure in the agricultural sector. Remember, they had made some commitments around buying, uh, uh, you know, taking uh, taking some incremental agricultural products. Uh, and Trump was concerned a little bit. Uh, at least he communicated on TV that, you know, the farmers are with me and they, they understand. So I think they read in between the lines that he's concerned that he might lose their support. So they thought, oh, well, why don't we put some pressure there? So they didn't buy. Causes more pressure for, for farmers. That really pissed them off. And also decided to introduce their own tariffs on some $90 billion worth of volume of whatever goods are, are being sold there. Now, they can't retaliate pound for pound with the tariffs because our trade imbalance is such that we, we buy far more from them than they buy from us. Um, so, reasonably, Trump Trump took the news fairly well. He went apeshit. So he put $300 billion under 25% uh, tariff, and he ordered the American people to move out of China. And that was, uh, that of course is what made the news first and foremost, because, of, you know, everybody said, who the hell does he think he is? He orders, is he he's a king, blah, blah, blah. In defense of that, I would say this. If you think about where, you know, what Donald's resume has been in terms of uh, his uh, interpersonal, his interactions with anybody, since 12, he was sent off to military school, right? So basically graduated there, then uh, I think he went uh, to some Ivy League. And then into a business, right? So he went from military school to an Ivy League college to a multi-billion dollar organization being the, the sole owner of it and then being president of the United States. I think when he says order, it may not necessarily be, um, you know, it isn't necessarily a monarchical order. It may come from his military roots, but I think it's understandable. I think a lot of people make the mistake of taking him literally and take instead of taking him seriously. Um did he have the authority to order? Actually, he did. Um, there's a trade agreement that dates back to the 70s uh, that basically does give him the order. And then there's also the national security aspect. Much like he blocked all dealings with uh, Huawei, um, 
he's basically saying, he's signaling a very key thing to all of our businesses, which is there's going to be turmoil with China in the trade department. So if you're going to be affected by it, get the fuck out because we are going to have problems with them. And believe it or not, despite all of the media coverages, all the purchasing managers out there, they've got the message loud and clear. I mean, not that they hadn't gotten the message from before, but to the degree that this looked like it was going to be closed now because the deal was coming close, people now got the message to say, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to find alternatives to China because this is going to be a protracted war. That was what that message was. So small businesses, I, you know, they will be hurt. Uh, if to the degree that they can't react, to the degree that they haven't planned, they're gonna they're gonna have some problems. Now maybe he'll reintroduce some um, uh, some subsidies. Maybe not. Uh, he has been responsive to certain sectors when people approach him about hey, take these you know put pull these guys off the tariff list because this will screw up my business or my business. So he can't he he has been responsive, but also he can't necessarily take everything off the tariff list because then it loses its effectiveness. And in terms of uh, in terms of white tariffs, well, that's the only that's the only real weapon as a president that he has to support his team. You know, he can't necessarily uh, have more sophisticated weapons without re relying on Congress, and Congress isn't willing to do anything for him. So he's going to use the hammer he's got. But sourcing is already moving. You got India, you got Mexico, you got USA, even you know people coming back to here, and every single exit reduces China's uh, uh, leverage. Now. Um, there's a lot of countries that are eager to accommodate a commercial deal because they want to secure military cooperation. And I'll explain why that is, because that's really the underlying uh, context here. And then, of course, tariffs are, are accruing. They're, they're racking up quite a big chunk, right? And he's able to use these money to compensate for a variety of areas of, uh, uh, of the marketplace where he may have some shortfalls. Because remember, he's not only fighting China, he's going to be fighting EU. He's already, you know... Uh, he already kind of made uh, Canada and Mexico crumple, but the, this administration wants bilateral deals with everybody. They don't want TPP type stuff. So this is going to help. At the same time, people keep saying that it, you know, this unrest drives beta in the marketplace. Yeah, it does. So do his tweets. So if you really look at, he isn't an idiot. Many things that he said have had huge impacts uh, in the uh, in Wall Street. And while Wall Street can't predict when he's uh, going to send a twit tweet, he can. And uh, and the only reason that I, I'm, I'm flabbergasted, because um, it seems that liberals in general tend to react first to the least important part of, his, uh, of the rhetoric. But realistically, his ability to send the market tumbling or make the market come back is a boon to anybody that, that can just use normal logic, watch his activities, and then make bets on the marketplace. Because he's been able to move the market five, 600 points at a time with a tweet. And, and, and if you read the tweet, you know the areas that are going to move and you know the direction they're going to move. And I'm surprised that, you know, for all of the bitching, I think there's a lot of stockbrokers out there, the, the hedge funds guys, that are loving this guy. Because the vast majority of the uneducated or, you know, the the unsavvy investor will react like cattle and he is driving a whole lot of cattle right now now okay at the same time pressure is building up and political pressure is going to be both against him and for him and uh the part of it we'll, we'll touch in the other two parts is uh china has a great deal of control over pr and uh that's going to come more and more into sharp focus as this continues so that's it for tariffs we'll uh we'll move on to part two in a bit